Hey, y'all, and welcome to the Pre-Med Voice, the podcast where your voice is heard. I'm your host, Payne Smith, and today we have Lucy Schlink talking to us about gap years. Now, gap years are becoming more and more popular with us pre-med students because it gives us an opportunity to take a year in between graduating from undergrad and med school to kind of refocus, re-energize, and better our applications. So Lucy's got some great information about what a gap year is, why they're taken, how med schools view them, and what she did during her gap year. So without further ado, here's Lucy. Turn up, let's go! Hello, all my friends out there on Pre-Med Star. My name is Lucy Schlink, and I'm coming to you from Stonington, Connecticut. And you are listening to Pre-Med Voice. In this podcast, we're going to be speaking on the topic of gap year plans. Um, the outline for the podcast is, what is a gap year? Why do people take a gap year? How are gap years viewed by medical schools? What do people do in a gap year? And finally, I will share how I've spent my gap year thus far. So what is a gap year? A gap year is typically a year off between graduating university and beginning studies in medical school. But some people take more than one year off. So why do people take a gap year? There are mainly three reasons why a person would take a gap year. One reason is a person wants to strengthen their application to medical school, or they're not really sure medical school is right for them, and they're trying to solidify their decision. Or there's a third reason, and it's occasionally that a person wants to pursue a completely different interest before they start medical school. So how do medical schools view someone taking a year off, or more than one year off, before they start medical school? Um... So the average acceptance age to medical school is actually starting to trend up. And this is because medical schools are starting to become more interested in mature candidates. So most medical schools are actually viewing gap years as something more positive. So what does this mean? So this means that you should be making the most of a gap year if you choose to take some time off. And this doesn't mean that you decide to take a gap year just because you want to study for the MCAT. Because if you decide, oh, I'm just going to study for the MCAT, and I'm going to sit home, and I'm going to study every day, and I'm not going to work, I'm not going to volunteer, and I'm not going to have a um, job shadowing a doctor, the medical schools aren't going to view this very highly. So if you're deciding that you're going to take a gap year, make sure that you line up some pretty good opportunities beforehand. And this brings us to what do people typically do during a gap year? So there are four things, different categories that people typically fall into. And the first category is the people that decided later on in their undergraduate career that they wanted to go to medical school and they haven't finished their pre-medical school requirements. So there are these programs called post programs, um, and there are a lot of different schools that offer these programs. And these programs tend to be a little bit on the pricey side, And they typically last one to two years, and they allow students that are in this circumstance to finish all of their pre-medical school prereq requirements. And sometimes these schools often have pathways to even help students enter into medical schools. So the second thing that students might do during a gap year is uh, if they have a low GPA, but they've completed all of their pre-medical school coursework, they might be similar... uh, eligible for a different type of post back, um, which would just allow them to take more courses in the sciences, but they wouldn't be able to retake the courses that they've already taken. And sometimes these are often master's programs instead of post backs. And often students who are doing these programs are just trying to boost their GPAs so that they can get into a medical school. Sometimes these students have already applied to medical schools and gotten denied. And they're just trying to put a boost on their GPA. Um, There's a lot of different schools out there that offer a program like this. One example is Tufts. They have a medical school master's program. And what these students do is they take the first semester 
of all of the same courses that the medical school students are taking. And then the second semester, they take an MCAT prep course. And they also do some, like a small thesis or a small project. And then they finish out the year and they're expected to sit for the MCAT and then apply again to medical school. Another school that has a program that's a little bit different, but also allows students to boost their GPAs is at UConn. It's a post back program, so it's not a master's program. Um, one track is offered just to students who haven't taken their pre-med coursework. And another um, is offered to students who have lower GPAs but want to boost their GPA, and they take science courses that they have not taken already, and then they're expected to study for the MCAT and apply to medical school. Um, and a third program that I wanted to highlight that a lot of students don't know about is actually at Harvard Extension School, um, and they allow you to take one class at a time, um, and then you can you can take one class at a time after work. So it's mostly students who are working and um, it allows you to take classes that are either in the prereqs or they're out of the prereqs. So you could use it to boost your GPA or you could use it to finish your prereq requirements and they're cheaper courses, whereas the post back programs and the master's programs tend to be very expensive. Um, so there's a couple things that you need to keep in mind. If you're interested in doing one of these programs, make sure you fit the, pick the program that is best fits your individual needs. You should also keep in mind that these programs are typically extremely expensive, and these programs won't help you get a job in a different field. You'll really only be able to use these experiences towards a career in a healthcare field. You should also ask with the program beforehand and see if they have pre-medical advising attached to the program because you would be surprised how many of these programs don't offer pre-medical advising. So a third reason that a student might take a gap year um, is to strengthen their application. And there's many different ways that you might want to be doing this. Um, but often people are trying to strengthen their application either in the way of research experience or clinical experience or both. So if you have research experience on your medical school application, it's extremely advantageous and it really sets you apart from other medical students who are applying. And one way that you can really set yourself apart from even students who have research experience is getting published. So some ways that you can do this is making sure that you stay in the same lab group for a significant period of time. And that means more than just doing summer research in a lab. It means actually getting a job in a lab after you graduate and staying there for maybe a year or two years and staying on the same project for a year or two years. Um, and this shows more than just that you got published because getting published is great, but it also shows that you were dedicated to your research and it shows that you were valuable to that lab as an employee, which is really great to medical schools because it shows that you have work experience and it shows that you have dedication. Um, so what is this job called? So if you were looking out in the job workforce, probably in January or February of your senior year, what kind of a job are you looking for? So these positions are normally available at large research hospitals and large research institutions. And typically, they fall under the position title research assistant or clinical research assistant. Um, so the duties for these roles vary grossly from lab to lab, but it also means that they're very diversified. And it's good to look at the job requirements before you apply to the job, because you might be very suited for one position, but very ill suited for another. If you find a particular posting that you're very interested in, you should reach out to the PI or the principal investigator over email if possible and express your interest to them because they really will see a lot of applicants for one position. But if you express interest to them specifically, they're more likely to read your application. If you're looking specifically for clinical experience, which a lot of students are coming out of undergraduate, um, a lot of students go down the route of getting some type of certification so that you can work one-on-one -on -one with patients. 
So some of these certifications that are very popular are EMT, which is something like working in the emergency room or working in an ambulance, um, a CNA, which is a lower level nurse, EKG tech, which is um, like the tech that will look at um, patients who are having a heart attack, or an EEG tech, which monitors the brain and puts the electrodes on. Um, and then I'm also completing a program to be a somewhat type of technician, which is called interoperative neuromonitoring. And I'm going to talk about that more at the end. Um, so even if you're doing clinical type work, but you're not working hands in hands with a physician, it's really important to continue shadowing a physician in your gap year. And it's also important to continue volunteering. So the fourth reason why students might take a gap year, and it's also very common, is because students want to do something completely different from medicine before they start working in the medical field. And often, there's really nothing wrong with this. I know several people who have decided to go work on Wall Street, or they've gone to work for a consulting firm, or they've decided to get a master's in com something completely unrelated to medicine. I've also known people who have been fortunate enough to just take the year off and travel and see other parts of the world. And this is also completely valid, but you need to, regardless of what you do in your gap year, you're going to be asked about it when you interview for medical schools, and you need to be prepared to justify why you took a gap year. So now that we've gone over typically what people do for a gap year, I'm going to give you a brief glimpse of what I've done so far. So I graduated undergraduate in May of 2017, and when I graduated undergrad, I started a job at Boston Children's Hospital as a clinical research assistant. I worked in that lab, which was specialized in neonatal neuroradiology research, and I primarily worked on two different studies, and I pri also worked on closing out a third study. So closing out means that the study had ended, but we had to do all of the paperwork to make it officially end. All three of these studies um, utilize the same technology, and it's a new technology. It's a type of technology that's a non-invasive neuromonitoring modality, and it's called near-infrared spectroscopy, or NIRS for short. So NIRS is a, the part that actually goes on the patient. is just a small black box that we would place on the baby's forehead, and it, it would emit a red light that allowed us to measure the CMRO2 or the oxygen metabolism or even more simply put, the oxygen that's being consumed in the baby's brain. The technology that was being used called NIRS is really similar to the pulse oximeter that they would clamp on your finger that emits that red light and it works almost exactly the same way. The only difference is that the NIRS device is not yet FDA approved for use on the brain so we would have to consent all of these patients before we could use the technology. So we were primarily using this device for babies who had traumatic brain injuries at birth, and these patients would undergo something called therapeutic hyperthermia. And this means that the babies would be placed on a cooling blanket before the first three hours of life. And the idea is that the cooling would help preserve brain function by decreasing their cerebral metabolic needs. Um, we were attempting to use this device to measure the effect it cooling has on the brain, and we would we were hoping to see whether or not we could use the nears to predict how well they would respond to cooling. Um, another study we were using this nears device on was with patients who had hydrocephalus, and this is a disease that's caused by cerebral spinal fluid accumulating in the brain. Um, there's many different causes for hydrocephalus. But most often, often in the U.S., we do not see patients who have it due to infection. Um, at Boston Children's Hospital, we often see patients who are born with a condition called spina bifida myelomeningocele. And this is when the spinal cord doesn't close at birth. And instead, it causes this bubble to form on the skin. And then the spinal cord itself would protrude through the bubble and was exposed. Um, in conjunction with the spina bifida, these patients would also have something called a Chiari 2 malformation. And this is when the fourth ventricle is um, congenitally too inferior in the brain. 
And when they would go to fix the spina bifida, um, it would actually cause hydrocephalus due to the Chiari 2 malformation. So with the NEARS, we would attempt to perform monitoring before they would have the spina bifida procedure. Then we would monitor them once a day after the spina bifida procedure until they had a procedure called an ETV CPC, which in layman terms means that they would drill a hole in the third ventricle, which is a system that allows for the cerebral spinal fluid to circulate and allow for a new passageway to be created and hopefully allow the cerebral spinal fluid to drain out of the brain. And then also it would kind of um, decrease the amount of CSF that was actually being produced. And we would continue to monitor these patients after that procedure until they went home. Um, and we were hoping that the NEARS would be able to tell us maybe why these patients were having such an increase in their cerebral spinal fluid and also why certain patients would respond really well to treatments while others did not. So um, besides just doing the consent work and also um, monitoring these patients with the device, I also would have to do follow-up on all these patients, which included scheduling them for MRI scans, um, actually conducting the MRI scans, getting them ready and prepped for MRI, and then I also would help doing the neurobehavioral exams. Uh, I really can't speak more highly of my experience working at Boston Children's and as a clinical research assistant. Um, I highly recommend working as a clinical research assistant as a gap year position. I will say that the hours typically are very long and you are expected to work not necessarily for the amount of pay that you should be getting paid. For example, my salary was about 35000 a year, and this is a very typical salary for that position. Um, I was unfortunately laid off from that position, and I ended up taking a position as a substitute teacher until I started my graduate school program. And I have to say that this was also very challenging in a different way. Um, I was working at a low-income school primarily with students from the grades K through 2. Um, every morning, I would come into a class of 20 to 25 students, and sometimes I would be the only adult in the room with all of these kids, and the teachers would leave you a lesson plan, and you're expected to get through all of the material that day with little to no experience with actually teaching students. And it really gave me a deeper appreciation for all of the teachers that I've had in the past, and it also ignited a genuine interest in teaching um, in my future, possibly medical students further down the line. Um, so right now, I am in the final week of my graduate program at the University of Connecticut, which is interoperative neuromonitoring. Um, it's a it's a small profession. There's about 3,300 people who are actually board certified to do the job that I'm hoping to get. It's a job where you work in the OR, typically in neurosurgeries, um, typically spine or open craniotomies, and you monitor the cranial and spinal nerves that are at risk during that surgery um, so that patients don't end up with deficits. And upon graduation for the program, I'll be able to work as a surgical neurophysiologist is the title. Um, there are two other programs in the country that provide degrees in interoperative neuromonitoring. One is at the University of Michigan, and the other is at Labor College, Library College. To become fully certified in this field, you need to complete 150 cases in the OR after you graduate from a program like this, and then you have to sit for a national board exam called the CNIM, and that's C-N-I-M. So I have to say, in all, taking a gap year is an amazing opportunity for me, particularly because I wanted to pay off my college loans, because if you know this or you don't, they will continue to collect interest while you're in medical school. And I also really wanted to spend more time with my family and to gain more clinical and research experience. So I want to thank all of you for listening. For more co podcasts like this, please subscribe to Pre-Med Voice Podcasts on iTunes and Google. Or please reach out and connect with me, Lucy, on PreMed Star, and especially follow up if you have more questions.
Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Lucy, for all that great information. I know I personally will be taking a gap year and everything you just told me, I definitely took notes and I'm definitely going to utilize. So thank you so much uh, for recording that for us. Now, I do want to add one thing. Um, I've actually started calling my gap year an enrichment year. I think it tells everybody that yes I'm still growing as an applicant and yes I am still growing as a person during this year uh, so I always like that term just a little bit better but there's nothing wrong with uh, um, there's nothing wrong with calling it a gap year so gap year enrichment year whatever you guys would like to use they're both awesome now for the listeners I do have some announcements for you guys don't forget to jump on to premedstar.com it is so easy to get on there with an account and it's so easy to connect, connect with people so make sure you jump on there and connecting with as many pre-med students and as many doctors as you can. Now, if you would like to be a part of this podcast and be featured on here, please email us at voice at premedstar.com. Uh, just shoot us an email with your name, a link to your premedstar.com profile page, and what topic you'll be discussing. So it's as simple as that. Just shoot us an email, voice at premedstar.com. Now, the last announcement I have for you guys is please don't forget to press that subscribe button. We really hope that you're enjoying the content we've had on here so far and we're only going to send you guys more and more great content so make sure you're pressing that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode thank you guys so much for listening this week we hope you guys enjoyed it we hope you have a great rest of your day and we will see all of you guys next week thank you Turn it up. let's go